Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we are continuing our look into the Spanish army of the Napoleonic Wars and we're going to be focusing on the cavalry. Now Albion Triumphant Volume 2 describes them as the worst part of the worst army. So let's have a look at them and see if they earn this unflattering sobriquet and the rather less than good stats that Black Powder gives them. At the start of the Spanish War of Independence, as they call it, Spain had an impressive looking roster of cavalry units. They are 24 in all, made up of two Cazadore regiments, a sort of Spanish Chasseur Acheval equivalent, and two Hussar regiments. Additionally, they had eight Dragoon regiments and 12 heavy regiments. So for those think like uh, French Carabineers before 1812, or sort of British heavy dragoons, so those kind of troops there. From 1803, regiments were formed of 10 squadrons in two companies, which gave them a paper strength of 570 men mounted, with an extra 130 on foot to remain in the depot. However, as is always the case, these paper strengths were not very often met, and most regiments was, were roughly half strength. Additionally, there weren't even enough horses to for the half strength units meaning that mounted cavalry in the field a spanish regiment would put out about 150 men making them a small black powder unit with some particularly the heavier units a medium or large size and we'll we'll discuss those in a bit each squadron had a number usually four that were labeled carabineros basically flankers and they were selected for, quote, the best behaviour, ability, and ruggedness. And they would be issued with carbines, and they would be the guys who would, you know, do the, the skirmishing and things like that. The most prestigious cavalry regiment in the Spanish army, and in fact the most prestigious regiment in the entire army itself, the so-called right of the line, were El Rey Regiment. And while we'll follow these chaps throughout the war, it's worth remembering that this unit, they weren't the norm. They were the very best that Spain had to offer. So any of their exploits that they managed to achieve, just bear in mind that that's not the standard cavalrymen. They are, you know, the elite of the elite, effectively. I mean, you know, as, as far as the elite of the elite of the Spanish army goes, anyway. So, the as we saw in the, the first two parts, if the army as a whole were stuck in the 18th century then, you know, I think it's safe to say that the cavalry were stuck in the 17th. Now, all right, yeah, admittedly, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but they had fallen far, far behind their European neighbours. So look, for instance, at the numbers of each type of regiment. Having such a high proportion of heavy cavalry compared to light is really good for that one day on the battlefield. It means that you've got the heavy superiority when you're on the field of battle. However, and it's something that we sometimes forget as wargamers, for the days and weeks leading up to the battle, and the days and weeks after the battle, that's a massive disadvantage. If the enemy's got better scouting than you, not only do they know where you are, and in what strength, but they can also stop you finding out where they are, and what strength their troops are. And we see this time and time again, where Spanish armies basically blunder around the peninsula, almost aimlessly without knowing where the French are, who's commanding them, what strength they are. And you now this just means that the the army, the Spanish armies just get attacked piecemeal and crushed with you know pretty much, you know, no effort at all really. Later as the war progressed, the guerrilla bands would help this and they would help provide intelligence, things like that. But um it would only really help the situation never achieved the superiority in the intelligence gathering until you know the British and their exploring officers would take over those duties. As for uniforms, the Hussars wore normal, in the inverted commas, Hussar uniforms, that's a Dolman, Police, and Merliton, which was later replaced by Shaco. They could very easily be built using Perry French Hussars with a saddlecloth sculpted in a similar way to I did for the Russian Hussars, so if you've not seen that video, check that one out in our live videos playlist. Uh, but with the added bonus, uh, this time, as opposed to the Russians, that you actually get the correct headgear in the box. So that's a nice bonus. You don't have to go around gluing tiny plumes onto a Russian grenadier head, so that's quite nice. 
Now, the rest of the cavalry's uniforms look really, really cool, I have to say. They are straight out of the Seven Years' War. And the uh, the period known as the Lace Wars. With, they've got like large um, cross bicorns on. Long blue coats. With different facings dependent on regiment. Now, the bicorns I particularly like. And I've, it's the same reason I've always liked the early French Karaziers in bicorns. I just think it's really cool. It's that... Um, that throwback to an earlier age. But as the war progressed, the Spanish cavalry uniforms changed uh, to a much more practical cut, presumably when they started being supplied by the British. But they were always, you know, fantastic colours. The, For example, the bright yellow of the Numancia Dragoons, that changed to become a rich green. And the bicorns were replaced with helmets that were very similar to those worn by the French lancers. So no, just boring uh, casks like the Austrians or anything like that. These were pretty sweet helmets as well. On In January 1810, these Spanish Numancia Dragoons, the ones I just mentioned who went from yellow to green, defeated a unit of French Carraziers, earning them enough captured equipment to found El Regimento de Coraceros Español uh, with 360 men under the command of Colonel Don Juan Malat. They wore, uh, and, and these guys wore um, red coats with French caresses and French helmets. So again, really easy to make out of the Perry's Carazia box. Uh, I'm, I'll almost certainly have some pictures of those up in the slideshow in this, uh, in this video. But you can have these guys, absolutely no conversions required. All you need to do is swap out whatever colour you were going to paint them and paint them red instead. It's really cool. Uh, they, I think the painting that I'm going to use here is one by Keith Rocco. He's a, a very talented American who paints a lot of Napoleonic scenes. He's very, very good. I highly recommend his work. Now, as with the infantry, uh, the cavalry units that were part of La Romana's expeditionary force to Denmark was a lot more up to strength than the other regiments, and they were trained in the French way. Upon their return to Spain, the Ray Regiment, which was one of them, had 38 officers and 634 men, so very, very close to full strength. There were five cavalry regiments in the expeditionary force, three heavy, the Ray, the Infanta, and the Algarbe, as well as two dragoon units, the Almansa and the Villa Visocia ooh, regiments. Blimey. The expedition to Denmark ended in defeat for the Franco-Spanish army, but they were repatriated by the British, to help in the uprising in Spain. They landed in northern Spain with most of their men, but <laughs> the British being the British kept all their horses, requiring the <laughs> requiring the cavalry units to disperse to find some more. While most stayed fairly local and to the army were added to the army of Galicia, the Ray Regiment marched to the Portuguese border and a region of Extremadura meaning that they avoided the disaster of the Battle of Espinosa de los Monteros, and the Ray Regiment would fight against the British at Wellington's... the battle that he said was his greatest victory, the Battle of Talavera. They would earn much praise for their performance here. Captain General Cuesta's after-battle report stated, quote, The Ray Regiment's intrepid attack and destruction of a column of enemy infantry. Its colonel, Don José María de Lastra was wounded during the charge and was succeeded with valour by Lieutenant Colonel Don Rafael Valpada. Captain Don Francisco de Sierra gained much distinction by taking a cannon while vanquishing its defenders. Ensign Don Pablo de Catanero, of 16 years of age, slew four Frenchmen and all officers and men of the regiment manifested proof of its valour and discipline. So some, uh, uh, end quote, some uh, some high praise indeed there, including one 16-year-old kid killing four Frenchmen, so uh, not to be sniffed at. As the battle drew to a close, about 4pm, a French division of four corps, General Laval's Confederation of the Rhine, launched a second attempted assault on Payar de Vergara, a redoubt positioned on a hill. The battery had recently been reinforced by more Spanish infantry, and Laval's men came under intense artillery and musket fire. Once again, riven by the storm of lead and iron, the Germans wavered and retreated. The defenders, safe in their prepared position, wisely watched them go. However, Colonel Don José María de Lastra 
Commanding the regiment, Del Rey saw his chance, and at the head of his 348 troopers charged. Caught in the flank, chaos reigned, and the retreating Hesse Darmstadt and Frankfurt infantry tried to form square. The troopers hacked down many Germans before they managed to flee into the safety of a nearby olive grove, having been caught in much confusion. Continuing their charge, the regiment then went on to charge the two artillery batteries that were coming up in support of the infantry, and ten cannon were overrun, of which four, three Baden and one Hesse Darmstadt, were dragged back to the Pajar de Vergara redoubt. Even the British historian Sir Charles Oman, who, let's be honest, was never known for his praise of the Spanish, wrote in his History of the Peninsula War, quote, The Spaniards had little to do upon July 28th, but what little they had to do was well done. The charge of the cavalry regiment Ray was well-timed and gallantly delivered, end quote. This is a rare moment of glory for the Spanish cavalry, who, it has to be said, overall performed abysmally, often being afraid to charge their French counterparts. Now, I have a little sympathy here. They were often outnumbered and outmatched by the superb French cavalry, and charging them would have been almost certain death. However, there is a middle way. It is possible to manoeuvre and make it look like you're going to charge, instead of just fleeing for the hills at the first sight of French cavalry. This would become a major problem for the Spanish poor bloody infantry, who, stranded without cavalry support, were pretty much dead meat. Of the individual Spanish cavalrymen, their opponents were usually fairly respectful. Our often quoted friend Chlapowski of the uh, Polish Lancers would write, quote, Some regiments which looked like black hussars, which I'd never seen before, drew particular attention to themselves. Their attack failed and was doomed from the start, as they had begun to gallop at a thousand paces, and so were exhausted by the time they had covered half this distance. A regiment of French dragoons was sent out against them, but advanced only at a walk, and, seeing they would not reach it, it halted and set out skirmishers, who were able to catch up with a dozen or so of the more poorly mounted hussars. Yet each of these, whether wounded or dismounted, fought on to the death which proves that these were valiant soldiers, but they lacked experienced officers, end quote. So now we get to it again. One of the main problems with the Spanish army, as with the infantry, was that cavalry officers were products of the corrupt court favourite system. Perhaps even more so, as cavalry is more prestigious and more technical. It's all too easy to see that the people even less suited to warfare than the infantry commanders would push for those cavalry commands and their experience and their skill would fall far shorter in comparison to the infantry with the cavalry. Even the Ray Regiment that we've so far praised, no longer under the command of Wellesley, were crushed at the Battle of Arizaga, and the guns they captured at Talavera were then recaptured by French cavalry. In this battle, they were commanded by José María de la Cueva, the 14th Duke of Albuquerque, his Wikipedia page states that he was, quote, an aristocrat, diplomat, and senior Spanish officer in the Peninsula War, end quote. And I think that pretty much sums up the problem with Spanish officers. You know, we look at the order of his achievements or, you know, his, his job roles listed there. Uh, the first one, the most important one, was that he was an aristocrat. The second one, that he was a diplomat. And then, you know, third least important, and probably least important to him, was that he was a senior officer. So that was a major, major problem. In 1814, the cavalry was reorganised. Each regiment was to have five squadrons of about 120 men. Now there would be three each of Hussars and Casadore, eight Dragoons and 16 Heavies, which included Rey, Renia and Caracos Espanol, who are now all Carazias. So obviously that last regiment got given the uh, cuirasses that were captured from the French. Now, we said earlier on that, you know, having more heavy regiments and light regiments is a bit of a throwback to the days of, say, the Seven Years' War, where those scouting armies were less important. I think the reason that the Spanish, by now under Wellington, were so top-heavy, were so, um, like, had so many heavy regiments, was that the British had a lot of light cavalry regiments, Light Dragoons, Hussars, KGL Hussars, things like that. So the Spanish were able to give them those heavy regiments, particularly Carazias, that the British didn't have. Uh, the British had no Carazias at all in the Napoleonic Wars, so not just in Spain. They didn't have any at Waterloo either. Now, those of you who've seen these videos before 
we'll see that I've not done it in the usual way I do, where I break down each type of cavalry and discuss them, you know, the hussars, the dragoons, the carabineers, you know, whatever. I normally discuss them by class, and I haven't done that in this video because it's really difficult to actually find stuff that these cavalry did. Um, certainly in English. Now, it might be easier if I spoke Spanish, which, uh, I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish. That's a bit of an anchor man quote there for you. Um, now, I think there's been a attempt at revisionism in the last few years to say that the Spanish were a little hard done by, particularly by British historians, and that they were made to be worse than they actually were, which, you know, for two reasons. One, to show that, you know, they don't claim any of the credits it was the british that won the peninsula war and secondly you know they did it in spite of the spanish rather than because of them <sighs> um, to be honest i'm naturally reluctant to accept this kind of revisionism it's very similar to the the view that the prussians won the battle of waterloo and the reason is that yes i'm certain that there were some things that were overlooked in importance that wasn't given where it should be, both in the Peninsula and Waterloo. But I also think it's it helps sell books, doesn't it? If you just say, oh yeah, I've written a book that agrees with everything everyone said before, no one's going to buy it, are they? So I sometimes think that there's an attempt to manufacture something that's not there. And to be honest with the Spanish cavalry, there's not a huge amount of evidence that they did anything that's really worth going into. After the departure of the Emperor, the quality of French troops in Spain was very poor, and they didn't have any truly heavy cavalry. I mean, they had dragoons, but uh, no carazias or anything like that. And yet, after Balian, which, don't get me wrong, was a significant victory, but after that one, they were unable to win a single field battle without the British taking the lead. If anything, it appears that post-war... The Spanish attempted to make themselves appear more relevant than they actually were by boosting the role of the guerrillas and saying, you know, oh, it was a it was a people's uprising that defeated Napoleon. I'll be honest, I think the guerrillas were certainly important. Uh, the as I said in the last video, the number of troops they tied up were very important. But without the British, I still think it, you could have tied up twice as many troops as they did. And it still wouldn't have made a difference. The Spanish armies were unfortunately that poor. Now, speaking of the guerrillas, there were many mounted units formed either unofficially from these bands or even some officially. Now, unofficially, they would operate as part of the random assor assortment of guys that were listed as guerrillas. So if, you're, if you want to use them on the tabletop, my recommendation would be to have your unit of guerrillas and have like one or two guys mounted, maybe firing from the saddle or something like that could be quite cool. But then there were the official Land Corsairs, as they were known. And uh, one of my absolute favourites of these, are, and I have to talk about these individually, were the Lancers of Andalusia. Now, these were formed in 1808 and were made up of Garochista, who were basically cowboys. <laughs> now, I, I just think a, a unit of Lance-armed Spanish cowboys is absolutely brilliant. Now, they weren't uniformed. But they would wear their, their local national dress, so that the national dress of Andalusia. And they'd look a bit like picadors that you can see from modern bullfighting, with a short waistcoat jacket and trousers with a low, broad brimmed hat. And it's one of those times that you can almost see uh, historical figures in action today. The second unit that uh, I want to talk about is the. They were adopted by Don Julian Sanchez who was known as El Chado, and he started with 12 troopers, but by July 1810 he had over 260. Now they were uniformed in grey, with those like, uh, they're called charro, they're large, like broad brimmed hats, not not sombreros, but they're like, um, like an English parson would wear. If you've ever seen like Father Brown on TV, uh, that, that sort of hat there. So um, associated with these hats, was El Charo, that they are actually called Charo Hats. Uh, so there you go. Although, having said that, there is a painting of him, and he's wearing a tarlatan, which, to be fair, could be artistic license from the painter, or he might be just in the painter's prop set. That's the coolest looking helmet, so that's what he had lying around. Another possibility is that they would have worn French Shakos, but with the eagle turned upside down, which I think is really cool. I'd like to see that on these new uh, ranges that are coming out, both from Warlord 
which I did a nap news quick on last week. So check that one out if you haven't seen it yet. There's some fantastic photos in there. I'm really impressed. I think they look really nice. Uh, all from uh, War Games Atlantic that should be coming out relatively soon in plastic. I'd love to see some Shakos with upside down eagles on because I think that's a really cool detail that will just add a little bit more to um, to your army. I really like that. So, if the performance of the Spanish cavalry in the field was poor, how bad are they in black powder? Well, really, really bad. Well, that's it. So, thank you very much for listening. No, no, no I'm, I'm only joking. I think I will dissect them a little bit more than that. Uh, they are very, very poor, though. They're, they've got lower stats than their French counterparts across the board. For instance, Spanish hussars have a hand-to-hand value of 5, and a morale save of 5+. plus. I actually think that is quite unfair. Now, I often say this in these videos, and I can understand... I, I, should, I should preface this by saying I can understand why Warlord, or you know, any sort of game that has these national characteristics, really hits certain units, or buffs other units as well. You've only got a limited uh, range that you can have these units, so I think you know you hit them on that range, and it might be a big jump, but you know you, you've got you've got to hit them somehow. So I can understand where they're coming from, but I think that's a little unfair. Uh, so soldier-wise, they were not much worse in combat than anyone else, as we saw from our Polish lancer friend. He was very impressed by their courage when they were actually fighting. So I, I'm not sure that the fighting skills of a French, of a Spanish soldier, sorry, were any particularly worse than anyone else's. But they should be hampered by poor command and control. The problem wasn't that they couldn't fight; it's that they didn't. If you know what I mean. So I think that should be more of an issue. Now we saw earlier on with the Ray Regiment at Talavera, when it came to the cavalry's you know preferred method of warfare, i.e slaughtering fleeing infantry they're pretty good at that so my suggestion would be that they continue to have the wavering rule which they've currently got that's to represent their lack of wanting to get stuck in but they only suffer unreliable when they're being ordered to charge so that would mean that you know normally a role equal to command value means that they get to do one move but if that move is to be a charge then it counts as a failed order. So it just makes them that little bit more difficult to charge. I think one could also argue that they can't use initiative to charge. But, I don't know. I think that might be, again, a little harsh. So, mm, I don't know. Additionally, I'd say when they are charged, then they must do a morale test as per shooting before declaring their charge reaction. So I say as per shooting... Because cavalry that takes a morale test in melee always falls back. You know, even if you roll a 12, they still fall back one move. So do it as per shooting, but it's a morale test, and it's before they declare their charge reaction. So they may have to fall back one move or two moves. Um, then they can't counter charge, because that is their going to be their charge reaction. Unlike the infantry, I wouldn't make an exception to these like poor stats for La Romana's expeditionary force because the cavalry saw very little fighting in the actual campaign and the training period that they were with the French wasn't that long so I think with them I wouldn't give them the uh, the benefit of the doubt like I would the infantry but what I would definitely do is make them large units because they were pretty much up to strength so I would say that they should be you know, if you have 12 as an average unit, units of 18 guys, which would look spectacular on the tail, so that would look awesome. But also, I think it represents them being almost up to full strength. I think the Guard and the Heavy Spanish Cavalry, speaking of uh, the Ray Regiment, are a little better than uh, the, the line, as you'd expect. They've got the 4-plus morale save, and the standard applicable rules, so Marauders for Lights, Heavy D1 for Dragoons, which I think is fair enough. Now, there doesn't appear to be any rules for Karaziers, despite there being three regiments by 1814, and certainly at least one by 1808. So, eh, I, I think that's a bit of a gap there. I would definitely give them the stats for regular Spanish Heavies, uh, the, the Dragoons, uh, but add one to their morale save as per Karaziers, Um giving them the standard you know, 3-plus that the French Karaziers or Carabiniers 
uh, get to get to have. Now, I don't often re recommend figure manufacturers. I'm going to do a separate series of videos on that. Next week, hopefully, I'm going to do a new series on getting started with Army X. So look out for that one. But I am going to quickly point out something here that you might miss. And that is that Perry's, the Perry Miniatures, they do a range of Carlist War um, figures. Uh, so check those out as well. That's like a post-Napoleonic Spanish Civil War. Uh, and they're also doing upcoming South American... It's called like the War of the Triple Alliance or something. I, I, I'll be honest, I have absolutely no idea about that period. I don't know. But I would check the uh, the figures for that to see if any of those are suitable. Because you never know. I'm not saying they are, because they're a brand new range. But it, it's worth having a look at them, I think. As for the regulars, I'd also suggest... That you could take a look at the Seven Years' War. Maybe see some nice figures there. Front rank have a quite a nice Seven Years' War range. To be fair though, they also have quite a nice Spanish Napoleonic range as well. Um, so my what basically what I'm saying is. Don't just restrict yourself to looking at Napoleonic figures. Have a look at slightly earlier, one, earlier ones. And have a look at slightly later ones as well. Particularly for wars either in Spain or South America. So that's it for the Spanish. Not so deep on this one, and that's because the Spanish cavalry were not really that impressive, I have to say. Um, but thank you very much for listening. I hope to see you in the next one. As I say, it's going to be the start of a new series. Thank you for listening this long. If you haven't subscribed, please think about it, because it'll help you get the videos a bit more regularly including the Napoleonic News ones, which I'm determined to do slightly more of. But thank you very much for listening. See you in the next one. Goodbye.